So welcome everyone um, to this webinar series uh, coming straight from the living room to you. My name is Diana Neary. Um, we're here in the living room in the home of supportive care and integrative oncology at the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Comprehensive Cancer Centre in Sydney, Australia. Um, a Lifehouse, we aim to provide cancer treatment in a way that supports, nurtures and empowers patients, their families and carers through mutually beneficial partnerships. Integrative oncology is part of the holistic supportive care delivery forms an integral part of Lifehouse comprehensive cancer care by complementing clinical treatments to improve patient outcomes from the time of diagnosis throughout treatment and beyond. We hope this series complements other webinars and podcasts in this field to assist in informing people as to how best to live well with cancer. Now, um, first of all, I'd uh, like to welcome Whiter Tang and Professor Judith Lacey. And um, I might just ask you to quickly uh, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about um, you know, your, your interest in the topic and why you believe it's important and why you believe it's important that we share this knowledge um, with our um, colleagues, fellow colleagues and patients. Okay, I might just pass on the word to you then, Whiter. Okay. Hi, everyone. Really nice to have everyone here and joining in. Um, my name is Whiter. I'm a pharmacist at Lifehouse. And um, I guess my, very briefly, um, I started in oncology back in the day as well. I've got how many, many years ago. And um, I've done clinical trials, oncology, and I seem to always, even though I'm rotating around different special specialities, I always end up coming back to oncology. And I was living in Melbourne and uh, 2013 when I heard about Lifehouse opening and this job came up and I moved from Melbourne to Sydney to join Lifehouse from the very beginning and I've loved it since. And um, yeah, uh, any, what else about me? Uh, I do a little bit of um, part-time tutoring at the university as well and I just love interacting with patients and learning from you guys and um, because that is the best way to learn um, yeah that's me and just yeah hope you enjoy the session thank you Judith hi my name's Judith Lacey and I am the head of supportive care and integrative oncology here at Lifehouse I've been here five years now now just as a bit of a disclaimer for this series we're going to be talking about herbs and supplements and uh, uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy and other targeted treatments and cancer. But these are some of these views are going to be our own and they're not necessarily the views of Lifehouse and they're not in place of seeing your health professional or um, consulting with uh, your pharmacist or your health professional. So it's really just an informative session. I... Um, Saying that, I'm really delighted that these webinars are taking place. I, my background is uh, originally in uh, palliative care. I found an interest in integrative medicine and supportive care as we keep people living longer for cancer. There was this real need that I had to understand how to expand the toolbox of what we could offer patients to keep them living well with cancer. And uh, today's topic is on... Um, will inform a part of that as a part of this holistic view of what integrative oncology is and holistic supportive care is, which is uh, lifestyle changes, mind-body therapies, and safe use of selected herbs and supplements, as well as using foods to enhance and um, keep you living well with cancer. So this is just uh, an opportunity to share some knowledge. And, um, and I, I'm in a position to share some. Fantastic, thank you. So what we were thinking is, um, we'd start out with two um, presentations. First, uh, Wyder will be talking to us, then uh, Judith will uh, share some of her knowledge. And um, we'd like to encourage uh, those of you who do have questions to type those in the Q&A box. At the end of the hour, um, we will have some, save some time for you uh, to, yeah, ask these questions and, and I'll be putting those then to Wider and to Judith um, in view of them uh, giving you some further information on things that 
um, you know, might be uh, of specific interest to you. So uh, without further ado, uh, Wider, um, I would like to ask you to uh, present your slides. Thank you. All right. Now, can everyone see my slides? Great. So now I have 20 minutes to give you an overview of anti-cancer therapies, and it's a huge topic in a very short amount of time. So, and I think this topic of just an overview of different types of cancer drugs would tie in very nicely with the topic of herbs and supplements, because you need to know um, what they are, what the different types are, um, essentially how they work and have a bit of an understanding to really appreciate the different different types of interactions or how it could work together with herbs and supplements, which Judith will um, talk about later. So I'll be talking about just a little bit about the evolution of cancer drugs and a bit of a timeline. We're going to be talking about the main types of anti-cancer therapies, the chemotherapy, target therapy, immunotherapy, and just a touch on drug interactions. So if we look back, we can actually look at cancer drugs or cancer therapy all starting back in the days of ancient Egypt and Greek times where they have radical surgery, which, you know, probably not huge success rates back then. And then in the end of the 1800s, you've got the discovery of X-ray, which is the first modern approach of modern oncology or medical oncology. And then we get the chemotherapy, um, which actually in the 1940s after World War II, they, we discovered these anti, a cytotoxic anti-tumor drugs. And actually from the war, the, we, the nitrogen mustard gas was used for war purposes. And there was a ship that blew up and then there's toxic gas of nitrogen mustard gas release, gas release, and uh, thousands of people actually ended up dying. And they realized, oh, you know, there's toxicity to their bone marrow. And then they discovered actually, maybe this type of nitrogen mustard gas can be used for cancer treatment as well. So that's how it all began with chemotherapy. And then in 1980s, we've got a breakthrough with um, these new technology in molecular and cellular um, targets in cancer where um, we, we, um, the scientists have been using computer um, generating to see predicting molecules that might target different um, cancer um, activities. And then in the most recent turn of the millennium, we've got genetic engineering studies that um, come up with monoclonal antibodies and then checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, which is immunotherapy, using the immune system against cancer. So the first type of chemotherapy, the first type of anti-cancer therapy I'll be talking about is chemotherapy and how does it actually work? So if you are on chemotherapy, I mean, you probably know this or aware of this, but essentially cancer cells are characterized by uncontrolled cell division. So that's when cancer cells no longer have the checks and balances in place to control and limit cell division. So it's just dividing uncontrollably. And then chemotherapy stops the cell division by various mechanisms, either damaging the RNA and DNA that tells the cell how to copy itself, or it might induce cell suicide. And there's all these different types of chemotherapy out there. Um, there's some examples and which you may or may not be familiar with, um, but I'll, and it might not be all relevant to you, but it's interesting just to go through different types. So the first type are the platinum alkylators, which we call, and uh, they are, for example, cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaliplatin. And these are the heavy metal. These are the type of heavy metal and they damage the DNA and they keep the cells from reproducing. And these heavy metals can accumulate in our nerves, which can cause nerve damage. So say, for example, causing peripheral neuropathy and can cause damage to kidneys as well. Um, and we have another class of medications called taxanes, such as paclitaxel and docetaxel. And you can see this here is a Pacific yew tree. So taxanes or paclitaxels originally made from these Pacific yew trees. 
And we've got vinca alkaloids such as vincristine. Um, and these are made from the periwinkle plants. So um, if you look at the earlier type of chemotherapy, they're made from herbs and plant extracts. So um, if you think, oh, okay, you know, it's, it's safe to take all herbs and maybe they're all uh, effective in chemo and cancer therapy and all that. Yes, um, herbs can be used, but just to make sure big, these herbs can cause side effects as well if not used properly or in a controlled manner. And then we've got poisomerase inhibitors such as arenotecan and etoposite. And again, these are from these wild mandrake plants or it's semi-synthetic, so um, half in the lab and half derived from these plants. And then we've got anti-metabolites such as pemetrixin and gemcitabine, which are just made in the lab. Um, now, we've got all these different types of chemotherapy that works on different parts of the cell cycle. So some, um, so these are when the cells divide on these um, mitopic, mitop, mitosis. And so in some, um, say the anti-metabolites, they, um, they are these, I guess, fake or false substitutes for DNA and RNA, RNA parts. That's, that's how they disrupt the DNA replication. And so they all work differently in the cell cycle. And that's why sometimes we can combine chemotherapy because they all work differently. And when we can give different chemotherapy together, it's an opportunity to use lower doses of these chemotherapy. Hence, we don't get such toxic effects, side effects from these chemo. And also by combining these different types of chemotherapy and them all working with different mechanism, you've just got a higher chance of all the eliminating all the cancer cells because it's attacking it from different angles. So that's why we combine chemotherapy as well. Now, side effects. So we talked about uh, chemotherapy halting um, cell division and it targets rapidly dividing cells, which are your cancer cells. But unfortunately, chemotherapy doesn't differentiate the cancer cells and the healthy cells. So it can also affect the other fast growing cells in your body, such as the blood cells, which are produced in the blood marrow. So if you look at the, um, what the bone marrow produces, it can attack the white blood cells, which is what is used to fight infection. So that's why your immune system is lowered. It can attack your red blood cells or lower your red blood cells, which is um, what carries oxygen around. So that's why you might be more tired. You might be out of breath more. And it can, also can lower your platelets, which is what controls bleeding. So you might be bruising more, bleeding, um, risk is higher, et cetera. Other fast growing cells include cells of the gastrointestinal tract, so all the way from the mouth, hence you've got mucositis or mouth ulcers, all the way down the esophagus to stomach, intestines, and that's why you can get, say, diarrhea um, and other side effects like that. Uh, hair follicles are affected, the cells there are affected, hence hair loss, and also reproductive systems, so that's why it um, can affect your fertility. Okay, so that was chemotherapy in a nutshell. And what about targeted therapy? So I don't know if anyone of you remember this. Well, this is from 2001 in May, and these are the revolutionary new pills like Gleevex. So these, this is one of the very first targeted therapy um, that was discovered in, for um, chronic myeloid leukemia. And it was a game changer because I think before, before this was discovered, um, if you got diagnosed with CML in your prognosis in five years time, I think it was about 20 to 30%. So 20 to 30% that you'll still be alive. But then after this, it was about 90%. So um, big difference that this has made. Oops. Okay. Now, before we talk about targeted therapies, we need to talk about biomarkers. Oh, what happened to my camera? Um, anyway, oh. <laughs> anyway, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, 
Hmm. Not sure why that stopped. Anyway, hello. Um, so biomarkers, biomarkers and cancer. So these are certain proteins or molecules that give doctors a more detailed picture of the tumor. And they found either on the surface of cells or in the genes that program cells. And for example, you might have you know, heard these terms such as like HER2 receptors and breast and stomach cancer or EGFR mutations, BRAF mutations or KRAS mutations and other ones like ALK or KIT mutations. And these biomarkers can help doctors decide which treatments work best instead of looking at this picture where chemotherapy, we're just, we're just targeting all sorts of cells. But then this is specific. If we know what, what biomarkers are found on those cancer cells, we'll be able to treat it specifically. So there's two main types of targeted therapy. There's your small molecule drugs and your large molecule drugs. So you see here the HER2, EGFR, VEGFR, these are your biomarkers. So they can either work within the cell or outside the cell. So the small molecules are small enough to enter a cancer cell. So they work inside and they work by targeting the substances inside and the um, signals inside and blocking the cancer growth. And you might also know the term as tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's usually, the dr it's usually drugs that are given as an oral form, usually given daily. Um, and it usually ends with an ib, so like lapatinib, alotinib, jafitinib. So you can tell that they're tyrosine kinase inhibitors by the, being a, a, a nib or ib. So these are small work inside, usually orally, whereas the large molecules, which are usually MAMs, work outside the cell. And they can work on the same biomark as well um, that, that are on the surface. And these are because these are large molecules, these are usually given intravenously and they usually have a longer half-life. Uh, so that means that you can give it, say, every two or three weeks or even longer. And um, yeah, what else? There's also a different type of MABs that call angiogenesis inhibitor because there are some tumors, the tumors are, actually need blood supply as well. And these blood supply uh, supply the tumors with oxygen, nutrients, minerals. And if we can block this blood vessel growth, we can block it feeding the tumor. And that's another way that um, these, these angiogenesis inhibitors can work with targeted therapy. Um, now, the targeted therapy side effects, it really depends on the target. So if we look at uh, drugs such as the EGFR or the epidermal growth factor receptor, so if you think of the term epidermal, that's on your skin. Hence, with EGFR inhibitors, you get side effects like rash, acne, dry skin, um, and other type of side effects. But that's why you have these particular side effects, whereas the angiogenesis inhibitors, the one with the blood tumor vessels, which is the vascular endothelial growth factor, um, the side effects are related to the um, blood vessel, like blood, so hence you get high blood pressure, you get bleeding risks and um, side effects, other side, side effects, whereas HER2, like your trastuzumab, pertuzumab, um, that one, if you're on a, uh, that type of therapy, you'll know that you'll need regular monitoring of your heart because HER2, um, like HER2 antagonists like Herceptin or trastuzumab, they also block the HER2 heart cardiac receptors, which makes repairing the heart, um, any heart damage more difficult, hence um, all these target therapies, the, it just depends on the target. Okay, all right, let's move on to immunotherapy and how are they different to targeted therapy? So, if we just look at our body's immune system, our body's immune system normally has something called immune surveillance and the T cells that in our immune system would normally attack cancer cells. 
But, and these include, um, these immunotherapy can include ipilimumab, pembrolizumab, nivolumab. But what happens is, if we look at this diagram here, so this T cell normally attacks this cancer cell and get rid of it in the immune surveillance. But this cancer cell is expressing something that could be called, say, PD-1, for example, that says, stop, you're not going to attack me, and they are hiding from the T cell. But then when we have a checkpoint inhibitor, such as one of these drugs, you're taking the stop sign or taking this break off the immune system. Um, and then the T cell can then attack the cancer cell because it's not hidden anymore and the T cell can recognize the cancer cell to, to uh, get rid of it, basically. Now, immunotherapy side effects are a little bit different. We might think, oh, okay, well, immunotherapy, surely it's more targeted. It's not like chemotherapy. I don't need to worry about side effects. No, it does also have lots of other side effects. And these are a little bit different to chemo types of side effects. They don't necessarily align to the cycles and the days of therapy like chemotherapy. And because it is um, using the body's immune system as a to respond to the cancer cells, it can induce other immune-related side effects, such as, so it can affect your um, gastrointestinal tract as well, such as causing diarrhea, um, which could be a sign of inflammation. It could uh, affect your skin, could affect your thyroid, it could affect your liver, could affect your lung, and non-immune side effects such as fatigue or infusion-related reactions. So that's immunotherapy. And then lastly, are there any drugs I should avoid? So there are a group of enzymes called CYP, um, and Judith will go through this in more detail later, but the, this group of enzymes is, is an important part of a process of how drugs are broken down in the body. And there's certain drugs and food that, the, that affect the, the CYP enzymes, which include grapefruits, little oranges, a lot of the targeted therapies, um, especially the small molecule ones, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and also some chemotherapy, some antibiotics, some antifungal drugs, anti-seizure drugs, antidepressants, statins, um, and not only that type of interaction, but there's also other interactions where um, we have to look at uh, the different drugs causing the same types of side effects. So for example, you know, you, you might think, oh, I'll just grab some neurofin over the counter from the chemist, and it'll be all right. Um, so these neurofin non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but you still need to be careful because neurofin or, or any drugs like that class can lower your platelet levels and increase your bleeding risk. And you, if you remember the side effects of the chemotherapy, it can also lower your platelet counts. So in that way, they've got similar side effects and that's something that we need to be cautious about. Or similarly, if um, your particular chemo or drug may cause liver toxicity and that particular drug can cause liver toxicity as well, we just don't want that overlapping and causing additional risks. So the main message is always check with your healthcare team before taking any new medication supplements, vitamins, herbal medication, we're always here to, to help check and we always love it when you do ask um, because you know, we just want to help you have the best treatment for you know, your condition. So that's it from me. Sorry about the lack of camera, I don't know what happened, but anyway. <laughs> All right, so over to you, Judith. Oh, you're still on mute. I'm, I'm muted, so I just, um, hi, hopefully Waita will return. I think we'll try and find um, find out where she's gone. In the, so thanks Waita, I think that was a fantastic presentation and summary of something really complex in, in 20 minutes. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can 
see that and I'll just start the slideshow and work out. Oh, can people see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. You can see it. Great. So look, I'm, I'm going to start off by saying this is a huge field, herbs and supplement use in cancer care. And I think what White has highlighted is that there are a lot of herbs, there are a lot of botanicals that have become anti-cancer treatments. And so that we do know that um, there is definitely um, a role for many herbs and supplement, many, many herbs and botanicals in anti-cancer treatment that we still don't know enough about. But um, the reality is that a lot of people are taking herbs and supplements. So this um, very brief presentation is really uh, concentrating on the safety and some of the more commonly used herbs and supplements. So the, now I'm, I'm a doctor, which means that there are people who have studied specific herbs. And if you talk to people like Andrew Wheel or um, Paul Stamets, who is, know everything about mushrooms, they've spent decades studying just mushrooms. So I'm really giving an overview. I'm an open-minded person, but my role is safe integration rather than uh, being uh, knowledgeable of every herb and supplement. So if you ask questions, Afterwards, I may not have the full answer for you, but white or might. And if we don't, we're, we're open to look things up. So why do people with cancer commonly use herbs and supplements? I've listed four main reasons here on, on this slide. And what we do know is that cancer patients and survivors use herbs and supplements more than other members of the general community. The main reason we know that our cancer patients are interested in herbs and supplements is reducing the side effects of cancer treatments. And uh, my job is cancer side effects and cancer herbs and supplements may play a role in this space. Improve symptom management uh, after cancer and uh, after treatment. Reduce cancer recurrence and uh, but a big part also of using herbs and supplements is empowerment and that sense of self-control. Cancer is quite an overwhelming condition and to have some sort of control over your life um, and of what you're putting into your body is, uh, is very powerful. The other part that I haven't uh, included in here is actually cultural. And we have to realize we're living in Australia, but people live, uh, come from we're a very multicultural society and the, the um, cultural use of herbs and supplements in illness um, is, is quite significant. And uh, looking at different communities, um, different communities also tend to use different herbs and supplements throughout the world. So in looking at herbs and supplements, our main concerns are for the safe use. White has told you about the potential interaction. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about um, what we look for when we talk about herb-drug interactions and the basic mechanism of herb-drug interactions are similar to other drug interactions. So the first I, is called pharmacokinetics. The second is, and this in combination with the pharmacodynamics makes up this herb-drug interaction space. I'm not a pharmacist. When we talk about the pharmacokinetics, what this means is how the herb can influence the way the chemotherapy is, or the targeted therapy or other therapy is absorbed, how, it's, how it can affect the distribution to other parts of the body, its breakdown or metabolism and its excretion. And the pharmacodynamics are how herbs can alter the action of other drugs when used concurrently at the same time. So I'm going to go into a few examples to um, explain this a little bit, uh, a bit more. So the first is the pharmacokinetics. So pharmacokinetic studies are performed frequently with all new drugs, new herbs and supplements, if they're listed uh, with the TGA, for example. And the studies of pharmacokinetics focus on the action of, and I'll use cytochrome P450, the SIP system as an example, of the microsomal enzyme of this system or family of membrane transporters, um, which called the, such as P-glycoprotein, protein, and these play important roles in the absorption and the metabolism or the, the breakdown of many prescription drugs. 
and they also play a uh, important role in the metabolism and prescription and the breakdown of many herbs and many supplements and some foods. And there are certain herbs that can inhibit these enzymes at different points, and that can lower the drug efficacy, or it can make the drug hang around for longer and not be broken down, and which means you get more toxicity from it. And then there's the nuanced part of this, which is that some people express different CYP um, membrane transporters in different ways. And, uh, so they, and so you have this genetic polymorphism. And so some people don't metabolize certain drugs uh, well, while other people do. So the example that Whiter gave before was the example of grapefruit. We know the grapefruit rind contains something called uh, furanocoumarins, and these irreversibly bind with the CYP3A4. And so this, for example, in a statin that's commonly used for lowering cholesterol, results in a sevenfold increase in the absorption of this, um, anti, this statin. It, in uh, cancer treatments, can increase the levels of cyclosporin by up to almost 40%, uh, tacrolimus by 110%, and oxycodone, a common painkiller, by 67%. St. John's wort is one that we always talk about. You know, we don't, not, it's, it's there, it's on the shelf in Chemist Warehouse, uh, used for, commonly used for depression and anxiety, and uh, it can be self-prescribed. It induces CYP and P uh, glycoprotein by activating the pregnant X receptor. It can reduce blood levels of arinotecan, a common cancer treatment for colorectal cancer, for example, by up to 40%, which means that it's less active. So you're actually making the treatment uh, less active, uh, which is a hassle to, to do that. You don't really want to make the treatment you're having not work. And, uh, and so that's something to be cautious of. The other is uh, the tyrene kinase inhibitors that Whiter spoke about, like imatinib, osimertinib, lapatinib. And these are all major CYP3A4 substrates. And tamoxifen uh, relies on CYP2D6 and CYP3A4 to metabolise to its active form. So we always need to think when we're taking, when you're thinking about herbs and supplements and even some foods, could it potentially stop my treatment from working well or give me more toxicity from my treatment? That's the pharmacokinetics. Now well, let's look at the pharmacodynamics. So, we, so pharmacokinetics, when, I'm, when people are talking to me about herbs and supplements, I'm saying, uh, oh, let's see what metabolic pathway uh, it's in and, and should you be taking it together. When we're talking about pharmacodynamics, these comprise the interaction between drugs and herbs, resulting in a change in their effect, their physiological effect. So cancer care medications are prone to pharmacodynamic interactions with chemotherapy agents, anticoagulants, hormones, immune suppressants. So an example is, um, I've written down four main examples and four main groups here. The first is chemotherapeutic agents versus herbs with antioxidant properties. And we talk a lot about antioxidants like vitamin C and other antioxidants. Are they safe during uh, chemotherapy? Should you have them outside of your chemotherapy cycle? Uh, what's the half-life of the antioxidants? And the reason is that drugs such as the anthracyclines that White has spoke about, the platinum compounds, the alkalizing agents generate free radicals for their cytotoxic effect, for their effect that makes them work as a way of killing your cancer. Theoretically, and this is all still theoretical, antioxidants, antioxidants may therefore render these drugs less effective. So we're still in that process of reviewing and there are mixed results showing their potential for reducing the toxicity of these, of these treatments. So um, I know there are people that are very interested in does uh, vitamin C reduce the toxicity of these, um, of the chemotherapy, but the challenge is does it also reduce the efficacy? And until we have that answer, we go for safety uh, first and do no harm. The second is the anticoagulants versus herbs that have anticoagulant effect. And Whiter mentioned that some treatments lower your platelet count and can make you um, your blood uh, not clot as, e as easily, or um, other, and cancer itself can make you uh, clot more easily. And then you're off, you may have had a history of uh, DVT, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolus, and given anticoagulants. And there are some herbs that interact, and I'll speak about 
things like turmeric and ginger and fish oil, all that uh, have an anticoagulative effect. And that effect is additive, which means it increases your tendency to bleed. So we're very careful, particularly say, if you've got a lesion in your brain, you don't want to take things that keep thinning your blood or you've got something that may bleed. Hormonal therapies versus the phytoestrogenic herbs, and that means herbs that have an estrogenic effect. So we're very careful in breast cancer patients not to give somebody a herb for hot flushes. And the reason it's working is because of its estrogenic effect. And immunosuppressive agents versus immunostimulant herbs. And this is a really interesting space now that we're using uh, immunotherapy as well. And there's uh, studies at the moment that are being conducted and some of our oncologists are involved in them in a herb that's, for example, astragalus, which has uh, been used uh, traditionally in Chinese medicine that can potentially improve uh, white cell count and other blood counts, but it does it negate the immunosuppressive action of the chemo treatment itself. And so those studies are being done. And so when we talk about herbs and supplements, the most important thing is safety. And there's absolutely no way that any of this, any of us can know all of these safety, uh, all of this safety and all of this interaction stuff from the top of our head. There's a lot of herbs and supplements. Also, there's lots of different qualities of herbs and supplements. So number one is good quality herbs and supplements, well labeled and from uh, reputable uh, agents. But um, when we look at herbs and su supplements, I would recommend these two databases. The first is about herbs. This is uh, free. It's an app on your, you can download onto your phone or you can, uh, it's got a web, uh, web browser as well. It's produced by Memorial Sloan Kettering and what they have done and they continue to work on it is uh, put together a, a list of the commonly used herbs and supplements that are used in cancer care and the interactions with, um, with commonly used cancer treatments and they have a uh, view that is for the consumer in lay language and then a professional view with all the references and that's updated regularly and it's an excellent uh, quick and good reference about herbs and supplements. The other one which I also use is one called uh, Natural Medicines Comprehensive, Comprehensive Database and this looks more significantly at interactions with drugs and herbs, foods as well and drug-drug uh, interactions as well. That one isn't free and not open to the public. So with that introduction, I thought I'd just look at some of the commonly used herbs and supplements in cancer care, because as I started, a lot of people take herbs and supplements in cancer care. My general suggestion is if you are having a curative cancer treatment, be very mindful of any herbs and supplements and speak to your health professionals to make sure that there's no potential interaction that could make your treatment more toxic or less active. Um, I've also mentioned that in the survivorship space and in the fear of recurrence space, a lot of people take herbs and supplements. And there are a lot of uh, supplements that may improve uh, well-being during treatment. So I've listed the top 10 and I've added cannabis down the bottom here, which I won't have time to speak about today, but I can talk about for a very long time. But, uh, and I thought uh, these are probably some of the most commonly used herbs and supplements. And I thought I'd just pick a few of them to talk about in a little more detail in the few minutes that we have. The first one, and my slides are jumping all over the place, so I'll just keep my hand on the mouse. The first is uh, curcumin or turmeric, and this is a food, as you know. It's also, uh, this graph down the bottom here is actually the pub, when I Google, when I Google, when I do a PubMed search on uh, curcumin and cancer, you can see the number of papers that have been published um, over the years. This is from 1983 to today, where if you look at um, 2015, there were uh, 8,000 papers, citations on curcumin and cancer. And if you then um, jump up to August 2009, it had almost doubled to 13,000. People are really interested in the role curcumin has in, um, curcumin is the active 
um, constituent of turmeric, turmeric that, you know, that yellow powder you stick in your food, that root that looks like um, ginger and is actually from the ginger pet, um, family. So oral curcumin has been used to improve cachexia, you know, loss of weight uh, in general health in people with colorectal cancer, for example. There's been uh, trials looking at patients with advanced cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer to see of its benefit. It's used uh, often as an anti-inflammatory in people with uh, arth arthralgia, joint pain uh, with hormone therapy. Um, and it is, has an anti-inflammatory action and maybe an, maybe an anti-proliferative agent action. So there's a lot about people uh, using curcumin, but the most important thing, again, at this stage is until we know does it help or doesn't help is safety. And this is an example from About Herbs from that website I just referred to from Memorial Spine Kettering on the herb-drug interactions of turmeric. We know that turmeric or curcumin, we know that it, um, it can have an effect on blood clotting. It can interact with a number of different um, agents can, the, um, that are used in different cancers, paclitaxel, doxyrubicin, cyclophosphamide, some antibiotics and antifungals, and it's metabolized by the CYP3A4, so it inhibits this enzyme, alters its metabolism, so this is the pharmacokinetics, and this is the pharmacodynamics. Um, and, but according to, and so we don't know its effect, so we say be cautious if you're having an agent that is metabolized through any of these pathways when using curcumin, and err on the side of caution. I'm very excited about this next group of uh, agents that have become very uh, interesting. People are very interested in the role of mushrooms in cancer. And as uh, Wyatt mentioned, there are a lot of plants that have become anti-cancer treatments. And in Chinese medicine, mushrooms have been used uh, really for centuries, uh, medicinally for various purposes. They, uh, they're considered the forgotten kingdom um, there's, as you can see on this graph, that's also taken by PubMed. There's a lot of research being done, a lot of publications on the potential medicinal role of mushrooms and the most common mushrooms that we see that people are interested in in cancer are these ones here, reishi, maitake, shiitake, cordyceps, turkey tail, monkey head I don't know that much about, but it's mentioned as well. And obviously you can eat all of these and having them cooked in your diet uh, can have a um, potential benefit also because of their, uh, their nutrient value, but as well as potentially their immune stimulating and immune modulating um, value. And if you're really interested in mushrooms as I am in their role in, um, in cancer care, it's and in immune stimulation, then you should really look at the work of Paul Stamets and Andrew Wheel and see. Um, and the more you read, the more you realise you need to know and understand uh, before you can say, well, I should, everybody should have mushrooms. There are a lot of mushroom products out there. Um, and so again, if you look at just reishi using the Memorial Stein Kettering app in the herb drug interactions, we need to be careful with reishi that it can affect blood clotting. It, has, uh, it ha may impact on the immune response. It may interact at the cytochrome, it interacts at the cytochrome P450 and inhibits a number of, uh, so CYP2E1, 1A2 and 3A. And so therefore it uh, should be used very cautiously during certain chemotherapies. Finally, just in the last couple, two minutes, I'm going to touch on uh, the vitamins. Now, we know that vitamins and supplements ideally should come from your diet. And the importance of food um, and sunlight for vitamin D um, is, is really critical in cancer care. People go on a lot of restrictive diets. You have to make sure these are balanced and containing all the uh, natural uh, uh, vitamins and minerals and uh, that you need for good nutrition and good body function. Vitamin D is really interesting. Vitamin D levels, uh, you know, the government 
fluctuates in are we testing too much are we testing too little there are a lot of studies looking at the association of low vitamin d and uh, cancer the association of low vitamin d and colorectal cancer low vitamin d more aggressive breast cancer low vitamin d prostate cancer and lymphoproliferative cancers it has a potential role as a pro-hormone in in multiple uh parts of in you know cell proliferation and uh, promoting apoptosis and angiogenesis but as yet we don't know if there is a relationship between taking vitamin D and reducing your cancer risk and so I recommend people should be on a, a small dose of vitamin D but they should be measuring their vitamin D levels at some stage to make sure that they're not very low or too toxic because taking too much vitamin D or too much of any vitamins is also not healthy. And that's the same with most supplements. And I'll, if I had time, we'd talk about B12 and other supplements as well. And finally, on the shelves, probiotics. Probiotics and the microbiome. We're learning more and more about uh, the role of the microbiome and our gut health on our immune system. And I know that some of our oncologists are very interested in collecting poo samples and looking at our microbiome. I do, I'm very interested in gut health and a healthy gut and the safe use of probiotics in uh, and using foods prebiotic and probiotic foods in in cancer care and then supplementing when there are significant imbalances and so this is a whole topic on its own but that also fits into the space of the chemist warehouse shelf and this is you know just the probiotic space and finally, if I could talk for another uh, few hours, we could talk about medicinal cannabis and we think perhaps that needs to be another podcast if there is interest. So, uh, but uh, as a family of very interesting plants, um, they have a role in symptom management. They also, uh, particularly CBD, one of the cannabinoids uh, interacts at the cytochrome P450 uh, pathway and in high doses can uh, interact with some anti um, some anticonvulsants for example in studies uh, in epilepsy and uh, this that generally in small doses is uh, is quite safe with many chemotherapeutic agents and finally the words of a master dr donald abrams is medical oncologist and integrative oncologist in uh, in california and he said that, and his wisdom suggests that if treatment is palliative and cure is not likely, allowing patients to experience some sense of control through judicious use of supplements during treatment seems acceptable. I'm often faced with patients bringing in a shopping bag full of supplements, as I often see, that will be recommended to them. And if they're very wedded to that, uh, try dissuading them from using those that you see are inappropriate. And often you'll see that there's doubling and there is, there's stuff in a lot of these herbs and supplements that they're, they're mixed rather than single herbs and supplements. And they may have something in it that you really don't want your patient to be taking. I always look at um, what else can we provide outside of herbs and supplements, uh, particularly um, non-invasive, uh, non-pharmacological treatments. And do we really need to be telling everybody only to eat white food? during their radiotherapy. And um, although it's wise to avoid potent antioxidant supplements during treatment, eating antioxidant rich foods is generally regarded as safe. And you have to remember that a lot of these supplements are there to supplement an inadequate diet. So if you have a diet rich in antioxidant rich foods, it's much safer than taking um, poorly labeled or poorly uh, manufactured or um, inappropriate doses of antioxidants during treatment. And so I recommend when discussing herbs and drug interactions with patients to keep an open mind as to why people are keen to be taking herbs and supplements. Explain the reason to not uh, to suggest one maybe against the other or withholding during a certain treatment. Educate and health literacy is really important. Monitor for adverse events, consider the non pharmacal interventions, and then refer, refer to somebody who um, is really interested in this space and um, interested in the holistic care um, of patients uh, with cancer to um, 
such as integrative oncology or a medicine specialist. Thank you. So thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, Wider. Um, that was an excellent and very comprehensive overview of all things drugs, herbs and supplements. And um, we do have a few questions. So maybe um, this one is for Wider. You talked earlier about um, Nurofen and its potential interactions with, um, with anti-cancer drugs. And uh, the question is here, well, what about Panadol? Mm -hmm. Yep, so Panadol is generally a good choice for painkiller. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, if you are on a drug called Imatinib, which was actually the drug in that Time magazine cover, um, that one, uh, bec there has been studies to say that because of the risk of um, liver toxicity, then you need to limit the amount of para paracetamol that you take. But um, that's just one example I can think of. And so it's generally safe. My only other comment about paracetamol and if you're on chemotherapy is that um, we know that with chemotherapy, you are immunosuppressed and we ask you to take your temperature if you're feeling unwell. And um, if you do take paracetamol, there's a fear that, oh, it might mask a fever. And then how do you know, you know, whether you've got a temperature of 38 above and need to come into hospital or not? So the recommendation is to take your temperature before you take your paracetamol, just to make sure that um, we keep an eye on that. Okay, thank you. Um, we might just, sorry, Judith, yes? <laughs> oh, my only problem would be paracetamol is um, if you've got liver function issues, you should speak to your doctor that we have just about that and reading the total amount of paracetamol. Mm, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another really interesting question here. Um, so Philip asks, clearly a lot of clinical trials are needed and a lot of funding for trials comes from the uh, pharma. So who is going to fund trials for herbs and supplements, respectively? How do we go about resolving, you know, certain uncertainties that there are? Do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, well, I think that the uh, pharmaceutical industry is increasingly getting involved in the herb and uh, supplement space. But I, I really think that the companies have an obligation to uh, fund and support really good research in the cancer space for selected herbs and supplements. And so I think the, uh, the commercial interests um, are important, but I think making sure that they're, you know, really pushing the bound, pushing the envelope and making sure that we're uh, moving forward in attracting uh, pharmaceutical uh, pharma funding through um, supplement providers and herb and supplement providers is, is helpful. I think we see the, we're seeing this in the medicinal cannabis space, how important it is for that herb to be evaluated and um, put money into research. And I think we're going to be seeing that in the probiotic space and the microbiome space. The mushroom space is um, increasingly supported, but there are lots of gaps. And um, I'm open to receiving some money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I don't have comments. <laughs> no, no additional comments. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, we have another question here from Amy. Um, are you aware of any Australian CBD companies that are making pharmaceutical grade products for doctors to prescribe for improvement of appetite during chemotherapy? Well, I mean, the biggest study, beautiful segue to the one that we're running here at Lifehouse is in refractory cancer and loss of appetite in people with, in, sorry, refractory symptoms in people with advanced cancer and loss of appetite. And that's uh, opening up here now and that's with medicinal cannabis. And we know that appetite is really tricky with cancer and that's where medicinal cannabis um, is really at the forefront of a supplement or a, actually a herb, a herbal product um, that may improve appetite, that we think does improve appetite, but we really need to do these studies. And so we're just opening our, um, managing the difficult symptoms of hard to control nausea, uh, loss of appetite and um, pain with medicinal cannabis. And that's, there aren't many other herbs that have really hit the mark, are there, Whiteo, or other studies? It's a really difficult space and that's where, Okay. 
so okay. watch out for our and yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry. You mentioned an app, uh, the MSK app about herbs, and um, there was some question there. Is that available for app users? Is that available for everyone? Um, probably we could share uh, some of the details with that after the talk. Um, Judith, do you want to say anything? Sure. About that? So I'm just getting it on my phone. Mm -hmm. You can just go on your app store about herbs.com and just get it on your phone. It's free and you can sign up and get it and it's open to, it's open to the community. Excellent. Okay, now we have another question. At ESMO a few years ago, there was an abstract regarding a possible association that cannabis reduces immunotherapy efficacy. Um, Wider and Judith, uh, do you have any comments about this? I can comment. It was a, there was a paper looking at um, the, uh, the use, the association between um, cannabis and maybe making immunotherapy less efficacious and where further studies are being conducted. And so people are, so we're mindful to be, to be letting patients know of that data, that the jury is out, but um, that's one space where we need to be careful. And that comes to the immunosuppression versus immunostimulation balance in cancer care. But that was an observational, that was a study looking at people who were self-prescribing large doses of cannabis and on immunotherapy, uh, mainly smokers. And um, so it was a very mixed, interesting group. So more research needs to be done in that space. Thank you. So I think considering the time, we might wrap up with the last question. Um, basically, it was how do you find uh, someone who can, you know, um, explain to you what, what you can and what you can't take? How do you find an integrated medicine specialist? How do you actually get those answers if you're a patient taking supplements, uh, then you are diagnosed with cancer? How do you know, you know, can I continue taking these? Can I not? How do you go about finding, you know, the right people to ask? So at Lifehouse, we have our department. We have me, but I'm one person. Uh, we have our pharmacist, and I'm always looking for a pharmacist that says, yes, I'm keen on uh, doing the research. I think that is um, any philanthropic funding out there to, farm, you know, <laughs> to have somebody because I think it, it, it is a lot of work. I do that with my patients. It's a lot of work when people bring in their papers, but it is an important thing to do initially with the pharmacist, with myself uh, and with GPs. But it's really important to make sure that um, you feel comfortable in talking about herbs and supplements with your, with your specialist, that they say, wow, I really don't know about that. Why don't you come down and uh, have an appointment with Judith and go through that as well. And then we look and see what else can we, okay, what can you do with those herbs and supplements and um, what, uh, which ones should you avoid during this time? And I really think that it's an opportunity to engage pharmacy a little bit more. What do you think, Waita? What do you guys do? My, my comment for anyone, if you're a Lifehouse patient, just, just come to the pharmacy and just ask one of us. If you're in day therapy, ask one of the day therapy pharmacists. Um, just come in and ask with your list of medications. <laughs> And I get really interesting emails from the nurses in day therapy and from the oncologists and from the pharmacists. What about, is it safe to take this mushroom with this treatment? And we send each other articles and we discuss it and we try and come up with the best answer for each patient. Wonderful. So well, yeah. I think it's really important to know where to go with these uh, quite complex questions oftentimes. So thank you very much for that. Um, is there any last comments from either Wider or Judith before we end the session? Um, only, you know, just ask, ask one of us. Yeah, yeah, I think there is so much that we don't know. And I look, I personally find this so exciting. You, if you get me starting to talk about my reading on uh, Chinese mushrooms on medicinal cannabis on the microbiome, you realize that this is such a huge field and there's so much to learn. And 
uh, rather than accepting uh, the view of no, don't do anything, it's all quackery, we know it isn't, but we also need to know that not all supplements are the right thing for a person and you can do harm by taking them. The most important thing is eating well, exercising, uh, non-pharmacological management of symptoms using integrative therapies like massage, acupuncture, exercising, and um, eating a balanced diet that with prebiotic and probiotics and with all the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that you need. And so, and it's that plus the safe use of herbs and supplements that really helps people stay well. And that's really where um, what we try and achieve is number one is safety. And number two is stay open-minded. Which I think is a lovely <laughs> way to introducing our webinar for tomorrow, for next week, for July, next month, sorry, not tomorrow. We're not doing this tomorrow. <laughs> Our webinar uh, in July on living well with cancer is all about the benefits of exercise. We know that exercise is medicine and that uh, keeping our immune system healthy and well uh, requires a multi-dimensional approach and exercise is an incredibly important part of everybody's um, treatment regime if they have a diagnosis of cancer from the time of diagnosis during their treatment and um, into survivorship and beyond and living with staying well with advanced cancer. So we're going to have say, our exercise physiologist talk about exercise as medicine in our next webinar in July. Thank well, you, Waita. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.